Right, we will get underway as people, we're at five, uh, we're at 462 and we've got people from all over the country joining us. So wonderful to have you here. Uh, we'll get started. So welcome to this special Allies for Uluru Voice Town Hall. My name is Bryony Benjamin. It's my total privilege to be your facilitator today. And I want to recognise that I'm joining from the lands of the Darakinjung people that were never ceded and pay respect to our elders past and present. And it would be really lovely to know if there are any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today so we can acknowledge you in the chat. So please do share and we'll be keeping an eye out for that. Welcome. And that respect is at the heart of today's discussion about the voice to parliament. And it's one that I ask that we all honour in your participation today. So we, you are in for a treat this morning, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. We are joined by an amazing group of people who we'll be hearing from shortly. We have the amazing Rachel Perkins to begin with. Rachel is an acclaimed Aranda and Kalkadoon filmmaker and screenwriter. And if you have not yet seen The Australian Wars, uh, then you should go home tonight and do it first thing. It really should be compulsory viewing for all Australians. So do share in the chat box if you if you have seen it. And Rachel is also the co-chair of Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition, which is leading the Yes 23 campaign, of course. And we're delighted to have the fabulous Kirsty Parker with us. Kirsty is a Yulwalaroi woman who played a key role in developing the historic 2017 Uluru Statement from the Heart. She has an extensive career in advising on Aboriginal affairs and reconciliation, and she is now strategic advisor to the Uluru Dialogue and the Director of Reconciliation Australia, working to foster better relationships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Australians. So welcome, Kirsty and Rachel. So wonderful to have you here. And I'd like to start by introducing Paul Wright, the National Director of ANTAR, as our host this evening, who's going to give a short introduction. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Bryony. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's great that so many are joining us and more coming in. So my name is Paul Wright. I'm the National Director at ANTO, as Bryony said. I know many of you, and I'm quickly sneaking a look at the um, those that are joining in. I can see who's on. Uh, it's wonderful, wonderful to have so many with us. Uh, and this is a real moment in time um, that we'll be able to look back on, I hope, in a few months' time and say this was a really important step for uh, many of us in understanding the moment and just how important um, that moment is as we move towards that referendum where we get to hopefully emphatically as a nation um, state that we want Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to have a voice in the constitution um, to speak on the issues that are important to them and for them to know that so many fellow Australians uh, share their um, priority and understand the importance that we we back them up. So uh, thank you, Brian. It's great to meet you and, and have you uh, facilitate today. And yeah, I'm a bit of a fanboy of Rachel and Kirsty. So yeah, I'm, I, it's cool by association for me today, um, which is really nice. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have a, a really great hour together and this will be recorded. So we'll be sharing it across our networks. If you have joined us today, it's very likely you're connected in some way to one or several of the Allies for All um, Allies for Uluru organisations that have come together. We've mobilised um, as 200 plus civil society organisations. Uh, we've mobilised to show our support and to be there available and ready um, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership um, to point us in the direction. What do they need us to do to make uh, the referendum a successful one and this important moment. So that's what we're here to do. And that's why we've, we're blessed to have Rachel and, and Kirsty to sort of step us through the importance of it all. So it involves constitutional change, the referendum. We're going to be hearing a little bit about um, where the idea of voice comes from uh, this, today. I keep going to say this morning, but uh, it's, yeah, it's the afternoon where I am. And I should say I'm, I'm zooming in from home. I'm on Darug country out in the northwest of Sydney, so I pay my respects as well. Um, we're here to understand in brief how the Constitution works. So I'm sure many of you do understand, but this is a really quick uh, civics lesson for us all, a refresher. So I think that's really important to understand as well. We're going to understand a little bit about the arguments for and against voice and stepping through those. 
And finally, um, as, a, as a group of people together and understanding that moment, we're going to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about what we can do, you know, individually in the organisations that we're a part, part of, the communities that we're in, those uh, steps that we can take to make sure that um, we are enshrining Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in our constitution. The Uluru Statement, uh, uh, Peter uh, at Essential Media was asking me about my T-shirt. The uh, allies for Uluru were about voice, treaty and truth. And this is one of those three reforms of the Uluru Statement. And it's a really important first step. Uh, so we're, we're committed to um, making sure that this moment is a successful one and that we collectively accept that generous invitation of the Uluru Statement. So again, want to thank Rachel and, and Kirsty in particular for making time to be with us all this morning. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a really great uh, 55 minutes from here on out. So I'll uh, hand back to Brony. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks for that great intro. I'm right there with you. I'm also a big fangirl of Rachel and Kirsty. So very honoured to have them on the call today. Now, just letting you all know, uh, we've clocked over 660 people. Very exciting. But we're using a special feedback tool today. So it allows you to ask your questions, but also get a sense of how the room's feeling and we can get uh, a collective kind of idea of where we're all at. So if you are using a laptop at home, you can grab your mobile out and just scan over the QR code there and that will take you to the civility platform. Um, otherwise, click the link that's just been put in the chat box and that will take you straight to it. So um, if you're joining the Zoom from a mobile, just click the link in the chat. And when you're in there, press the heart button and we'll get a sense of how many people are in the room. So you can see the hearts flying in, that's great. Very tech savvy audience today. Well done to all of you. Um, and we've got some tech angels working in the background. So if you're stuck, just say help and someone will jump in and give you a hand. All right. So we'll, we'll start having a little practice together. And I know we've all shared in the chat box already, a lot of us where we're from today. But let's just share here uh, what lands you're on, what lands you're coming from today. You can put that into the into the tool there and we'll we'll shortly be able to see Oh, yeah, we've got dots popping up all around the country, which is a lovely way to see where everyone is visually. Heavy down the bottom of the country at the moment. Yep, yeah. <laughs> a few over in Perth. Hello. Up in WA. Oh, top of Queensland. Fantastic. My hometown, home state. Fantastic, and thanks to everyone else sharing in the chat box where you're coming from as well. Great, so lovely to get a, a bit of a sense of collectively where we all are today around this great land. So um, the, the next part of the tool that we'll move on to is to let you um, give you a sense just to share how well informed you're feeling about the voice right now. So one would be I uh, don't know much at all, to be honest, teach me everything. And a five would be, I could probably run this session, hand over the mic, Bryony, let me have the control of the Zoom. Okay, good. So the, the answers are coming in. I'll just give that another, another moment. We've got 100 and, 150 responses. I'll just let that go. But it seems to be hovering around the 3.2, around the middle. So that's great because it shows that we're fairly informed, but there's still quite a lot that we could learn today. So that's certainly what is going to happen in this next little bit of time. So let's start with what is the voice. So we're going to dig in. Most big ideas have a foundational story. And of course, for the voice, this is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So I'm going to pass to Rachel and ask her to read the statement. And while she is in the civility tool, I'd like you to share some words about how it makes you feel hearing Rachel uh, read it to us. So over to you, Rachel. Can you hear me okay? I'll just go into unmute. Apologies. Yep. I remember hearing this statement as it was read out by Megan Davis in the room of 300 people. Kirsty, you remember that moment? Extraordinary time. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent 
and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were born therefrom, remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in nearly the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth language in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Beautiful. Thank you, Rachel. Um, if you could share uh, the words that you're feeling and we'll see the words coming into the word cloud. I know the words that I would share, Rachel, were ripples of goosebumps as you read that out. Um, such a beautiful reading of it. So we've got words coming in. Emotional, hopeful is the, is the key word that's popping out there. Inspired, humbled, proud, connected, determined, uh, sadness, uh, encouraged, optimistic, shame, goosebumps. Beautiful seeing all those words coming in there. Um, so Rachel, it's great seeing all those words coming in there. I'd love to know how does it feel when you read it? What do you what do you feel? Oh, I just feel um uh I feel all the history of everyone that's come before and um you know, I, that we're still trying to attain this this aspiration, not just for Indigenous people, but for, for all Australians. So um, it's very emotive for me. It's caught up in a lot of history and, and hope for the future. I think that word hopeful coming out is something that I really hang on to. And, you know, that's why I'm on this call today, because I have hope that we can get there. So hopeful is a central feeling I have, yeah. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And Kirsty, I'd love to ask you the same question. Uh, you've obviously heard this statement many, many times and you were there when it was first read out. How do you feel when you hear it read out now? Um, I um, always try to really focus again on the words and not just become blasé about them because I have heard them and spoken them um, many times. What always strikes me about them is they speak of the mightiness of our people in the face of extraordinary 
um, disadvantage and extraordinary um, disenfranchisement from our country. Um, and also, um, you know, I mean, these are the sorts of things that could make me weep the generosity of our people in spite of all of those things that we are effectively making an overture to other Australians to say, please walk with us, we need you, um, uh, says to me that our people could show the world, um, you know, basically a masterclass in um, gen generosity and decency. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that um, hope and hopefulness is unpopular amongst some people, believe it or not, but um, it does make me feel extraordinarily hopeful. I love the part that talks about, you know, our children that, um, you know, when they, um, when when we have power over our destiny, they'll flourish and they'll walk in a, in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to the country. For me, it's all about generosity, um, generosity from us and also generosity from other Australians in accepting the invitation. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Kirsty. Yeah, it's absolutely so true. Just such deep generosity in spite of everything. Uh, and Paul, did you have any reflections as well just to share with the group? Yeah, well, every time I, I hear it, I, yeah, I get the goosebumps as well. And Rachel read it so well. And um, I guess in response to what Kirsty's saying, uh, that, that generosity really comes through as you just hear it again. And so the beyond generosity, I guess, uh, as a non-Indigenous person that has been passionate about this for a long time and worked in this space for a long time. Um, the two things, and I know it's been coming up a lot in the in that uh, word map, that that the humility in actually um, being in a place to provide that generosity in these beautiful words. It's actually taken humility to to um, craft this opportunity and this invitation. And so I'm moved in humility to respond. And I guess the word for me is like, I, I've had this urgency now to honor that invitation, to honor that generosity and that humility that's come from First Nations peoples that have every other reason to feel anything other than humble. You know, you can think about anger and frustration and, you know, hurt. And yet in humility and generosity, they've given us this opportunity. So I feel humbled and I feel an urgency uh, in the need to respond and to respond the right way. So that's how I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Paul. And lots of great comments coming into the chat. Thank you to everyone who's sharing. Uh, so, uh, Rachel, I'll pass to you now. It would be great if you could give us an idea of how the statement came to be about and how it relates to the upcoming referendum. So, yeah, how did we get here to this point? So it's been a, obviously a long time coming. <laughs> um, you know, we all know that uh, the country was occupied without any um, agreement or consent from First Nations people more than 200 years ago. So really the conversation started then, um, but it has intensified um, uh, in the last uh, decade or so. Um, uh, with the question of what form constitutional recognition might take. Um, and, you know, generally most people on the conservative side of politics um, would agree that it is good to recognise, um, you know, Indigenous people in the constitution. It's just what form that recognition might take. So, so this discussion around constitutional recognition, what the form of it is, what it might look like, um, uh, has been, you know, documented in a number of reports under the last five different prime ministers. And it was really only until um, uh, the proposal was put forward to have uh, Indigenous um, dialogues around constitutional um, recognition, exploring the form and of, of what that constitutional recognition might look like, that we got closer to um, having a... a uh, sort of consensus on in, Indigenous views. So there was a process um, of, of dialogues, formal dialogues that were set up um, around the country in northern, uh, around 13 regions. And that was uh, led um, mostly, in, mostly by um, Megan Davis and Pat Anderson. And they were forums um, of hundreds of uh, Indigenous people in all these regions, um, about 1,200 in all, I think. 
and um, they had civics, a discussion about civics and uh, discussion around the history of our people and um, and all those discussions were gathered and then um, uh, if you like um, solidified when we all came to Uluru people elected from those 13 regions people elected um, people to go along to the national convention at Uluru and I was a participant there as one of the elected people from my area out in the country and um, so that all got distilled down to these three central pillars of the Uluru Statement. Makarada, a Yolungumata word, which means coming together after a struggle, a process of um, traditional um, resolution of conflict, um, which we call the treaty part, and then voice, of course, which we are talking about today and truth telling. And, and it was sequenced in that order for a very um, specific reason, but which we can get into later. And so, um, so the Uluru Statement was formed. It had um, almost unanimous agreement um, of the delegates there. Some people obviously disagreed, which is fine and that's their right, but there was overwhelming consensus. Um, and so that's from here now, uh, we have um, a campaign that we have about 130 days before the referendum will be um, called or it will be staged and all Australians you know, some 18 million of us will get to vote on the question of constitutional recognition. So it's been a, an intensive period over more than a decade, but of course, um, uh, a big unresolved issue, the unfinished business of this nation that we're looking at at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you, Rachel. Wonderful overview. And so that's uh, now we're going to go in to talk about the process. So that's the heart piece of the voice. But there's a lot of mechanics, obviously, about how to bring it about. And so to establish the voice, we need to change the constitution. So we're going to have a little civics 101 lesson. And Kirsty, I'm going to ask you to talk us through the process. So if we could just start with actually, you know, this is 101. And some of you on the call may know this, but what is the constitution just for, for those of us who aren't across that? Morning, Kirsty. If you are there, can you? Sorry, I um, I double yeah. pressed the button and um, <laughs> all good. <laughs> and I said no. Um, so the constitution has been spoken about in a in a bunch of ways, but essentially, um, it comes down to it being a rule book for the nation, and the constitution um flowed from um federation in 1901 and set out the way that Australia um Australia would be. And I think it's worth reflecting that Australians generally, I think, don't have an attachment to um, our constitution or the nation's constitution in a way that um, North Americans do, for example. You'll often hear Americans talking about their, you know, their First Amendment rights there um, and the constitution. And um, Australians have somehow not um, uh, taken as much notice of ours, but um, I think they are generally now getting a sense that there is this kind of rule book that sets out the principles of how Australia will be um, and how it will be governed. And, you know, that's um, really come to the fore in the current discussions about, you know, we don't have enough detail and give us the detail that you're pros proposing to put in the constitution. And I know we can have a big discussion about this, but it is really important for people to understand that the constitution um, is about principle setting principles and that the actual detail is left to elected representatives. Um, and uh, we've seen some um, things happen in other jurisdictions, for example, in South Australia, um, there has been uh, legislation passed to establish a South Australian uh, voice to the South Australian Parliament. And people say, well, if it can be done in South Australia, why can't it be done in the national sense? Why do we have, a, have to have a referendum? And that is because the Australian constitution can only be changed at a referendum. All Australians have to be asked about this. Um, and uh, we saw, you know, the magnificent success of the 1967 referendum where more than 90% of Australians um, voted for the change represented there, which was an extraordinary um, uh, level of success and is um, testament to the incredible work of the likes of Faith Bandler and Mum Shirl and all of the people who stood with them. Um, but we, um, you know, and we're having discussions now about um, starting really with the basics to explain what the constitution is. 
and then explain why it's so important for people to vote and um, the, the need for us to uh, enshrine a voice in the constitution, that's what the referendum is about, that's the recognition that we are seeking, came about because um, there have been, I won't say countless, but many uh, First Nations or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative bodies that have been established and that have been able to be um, swept aside um, at the whim of governments. And when we went out to people in the dialogues in the National Convention, our people said, we don't want that to be so easily done. Um, we want to enshrine it in the constitution. So we're gonna to go to Australians and ask them if they will agree to this. So um, I can see that we've got a slide up there that sets out the actual requirements for the results of a referendum. Um, and as it says, um, a successful referendum requires a double majority of voters, meaning that a majority of voters across and throughout the nation must agree and a majority of states must agree. And obviously we have the Northern Territory and the ACT whose vote does count in the national count, but doesn't count in the state count. So, um, you know, we could say, you know, there are 18 million Australians who will be asked to vote at the referendum. And if we get, you know, uh, a majority, um, we're all safe. And that is not the case. We need people to turn out in force in every single um, state um, so that we can actually achieve that double majority. There are also people that are saying, um, well, how about I just don't vote? Um, and that doesn't help. If you have a view either way, it doesn't help your case. Um, so, you know, part of what I guess we're saying is that we want people to vote. We want them to be very informed about what their vote is um, and make sure that that counts. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Kirsty. So, yeah, so a double majority, as you say, to change the constitution. So we've got to get the majority of voters around the country, but also the majority of the states um, to agree. And sorry to those people in ACT and NT, but you do count in the overall vote. So that's that's really important. Um, and Rachel, I'll bring you in at this point just to talk about what is actually the ask that we're being asked to support in, in terms of that change. Yeah, so it's... um. It's slightly nuanced, I think, this, the ask. And so it's twofold. Um, it's con constitutional recognition uh, is recognising ultimately the, um, the deep um, history and connection of first people to this country. That's the, that is the foundational stone, if you like, of constitutional recognition. And it's recognising that Indigenous um, people and history are a central feature, a central part of the nation's identity, and that that should be in our highest legal document. It should be given that respect by acknowledging it in our constitution. But the form of the recognition Indigenous people have asked for is not only the symbolic recognition of us being in the constitution, but the form of that recognition is to be in a voice, having the right to make representations or to be heard um, to both parliament and the executive. So that's, that's the sort of twofold aspect of constitutional recognition. It's symbolic in that it puts us in the constitution and it's practical in that it gives us a voice when laws and policies are made about us. And so that's that's the twofold sort of form of um, recognition. And there's a there's, you know, it, at the moment the bill is going through Parliament through the Senate this week and next week, and it's going to get very ugly, let's face it. And there's going to be all sorts of discussion about this question about the voices role in talking to both parliament and the executive. So I'll just talk very quickly about that um, because indigenous people have been very clear that they want executive kept in there as well as parliament. So basically the voice would be able to give representations to parliament, to bills that are going through parliament, but it's important that we are able to also give representations to the executive, that is ministers and the bureaucracy, because we know that in the process of government, most of the policy development and development of laws is done within the bureaucracy. And most of the programs are run through the bureaucracies which ministers oversee. So we don't wanna just give advice just before a bill goes through parliament at the end of the process. We wanna be able to give uh, advice 
at the beginning of the process to the bureaucracy, which manages so much of our affairs. So that's what we're being asked to support. And it's going to be in a new chapter of the constitution. Because at the moment, we already have the power to make uh, laws um, and to legislate the voice, right? But we don't want to do it under 5126, which is called the race power, um, because this is not about race. We are all part of the human race. This is about recognition of First Peoples. And that's why it's in a new chapter of the Constitution um, around recognition, because it's about our connection as people to our country over deep time. So that's a really important um, uh, differentiation, I think, for people to understand. Yeah, fantastic, Rachel. And we'll just get, uh, if we can, the exact wording um, shared on the screen. Yeah, there's a question came in, Rachel. Uh, one of you could just sort of, you know, explain this to us, but a question came in around what is the sticking issue around the executive government um, piece of the puzzle that, that seems to be problematic for some people, if you've got any thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, so that's the, just, you can see the text on screen there um, at the moment. So that's the, that's the proposed amendment to the constitution. And that last point, point three, was added um, to really uh, try and um, ensure that people clearly understood that the voice would not undermine the power of uh, elected representatives and parliamentary supremacy. So that point three is absolutely clear that the parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws. So it's still making the laws with respect to matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. So it's still giving parliament the rights to uh, decide all of those things about composition. Um, but the thing about constitutional enshrinement is it means that there must always be a voice and that they must consider it. So in terms of the concerns about executive, look, people are saying that, you know, uh, well, you know, one parliamentarian said, oh, Indigenous people are going to say they're going to have a view on everything from parking fines to submarines, right? And but the Solicitor General has said very clearly that, um, and the Solicitor General is the highest legal advisor to the Parliament, and he was appointed under a coalition government. He said very clearly that the voice will naturally prioritise what it gives its advice um, to, and it will ensure that those are priorities. So people have accused it of doing all sorts of things. They accuse the voice that it will tie up parliament because it'll want to give advice on everything, that it'll overrule parliament. All of those things are um, not true. And if you want, you can go to the Solicitor General's advice, which is really straightforward. And he says that it will actually enhance our process of democracy. So that's really important. To, you can have a look at that. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. And um, I just wanted to mention there's been a few comments coming in about you know, if you're preaching to the converted here, guys, and what, what can we actually do? That's coming up. So we're going to talk through some of the objections and we're going to be talking about ways you can get involved. So please, um, yeah, know that that's coming. What we're doing at the moment is just, you know, making sure everyone really is across all of the, the foundations of it. So um, I had another question that's come in and please you can put um, questions through the tool, through the civility tool, um, and then they can come to me. So uh, uh, Kirsty, I might get you to um, answer this one. Just a question about sovereignty. And I know this question comes up a lot. Um, you know, will this process of bringing about a voice extinguish indigenous sovereignty um, as some oh. Thanks, Bryony. I just want to just double back to the um, the last um, conversation about, you know, the part um, about who the um, voice will be able to make representations to, and it includes obviously the parliament, government, the executive. Effectively, that's because we know that um, various parts of um, government don't necessarily talk to each other, but there are a lot of people, different people in different realms who have the power to influence an outcome. So we, um, the executive uh, refers to, you know, cabinet ministers, bureaucrats, public servants, and so on. And I've just um, uh, come from the uh, Lowager Conference 2023. And we had this great example. Um, it was uh, actually Professor uh, Marcia Langton was talking about the uh, response by First Nations communities to the COVID pandemic, where there were virtually no rules, but that our 
um, advice from our communities meant that the death rate for First Nations people was only one fifth that of the rest of the community. And that was from the extraordinary leadership that was shown by, you know, our Aboriginal community controlled health organisations and so on. Um, and, um, but that was effectively abnormal. It was a time when everyone was scrambling for answers and scrambling for advice. And our people, the advice that they provided to government made a real difference. Um, we saw the Biosecurity Act where communities actually opted in. We saw communities saying, we need masks, we need this. And the executive listened in that instance. So this is about making sure that um, we can speak all the time um, and not through, uh, you know, luck of the draw to everyone that can actually influence a decision. Now, in terms of um, the effect of the voice on sovereignty, um, the voice will actually um, enhance sovereignty. And I know that I don't um I don't mind when people ask this question because I think it's really important. You know, there are um there are um even suggestions within our own community that people don't take sovereignty seriously. And it's important that people understand that the referendum council that established and ran the process of dialogues, they set up a bunch of um principles that would determine whether um options could proceed out of the national convention. And the very first one was that um it must be an optional options that do not diminish Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty. So the Uluru Statement itself, um, Rachel read it um, beautifully and eloquently, says that First Nations sovereignty um, was never ceded. It asserts that outright and that it coexists with the Crown's sovereignty today, um, that our sovereignty comes from a different source um, to the sovereignty claimed by the Crown from you know, an, an ancestral tie between the land and its peoples. And um, we call for that ancient sovereignty to be recognised through structural reform, including constitutional change. So, um, and Rachel has referred to um, the sequence of the Uluru Statement, Voice, Treaty, Truth. Um, it's really important that people don't think, you know, we're going to set up a voice and then rest on our laurels and treaty and truth can come along in 20 or 30 years. It is envisaged that the business of the voice will be to advise on the um, Makarata Commission and the Makarata process that oversees agreement making, and that means treaties um, and also truth telling. And, um, you know, very firmly, I've got to say that sovereignty is not something that can be um, uh, ceded without anyone noticing. It's got to be a very deliberate act. And naturally, um, I mean, I don't know an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person who says that they have ceded their sovereignty. Yeah, thank you, Kirsty. Brilliant um, explanation of that. So I hope that answers that question for everyone. Now, I just wanted to note there are so many questions coming in and lots of great questions flooding into the chat box. Obviously, with 735 awesome humans on the call, we're not going to be able to get through them all today. We, however, will be collating them and we will um, sort of send them through after. So do keep them coming and apologies if we can't get to it today. Uh, but we're going to move on to dealing with some objections to the voice. So I know in the chat, this is what some people were really wanting to know. In the, um, the civility tool, can you go in and uh, let us know which objections are you either hearing or would you like guidance around how to respond to? Um, and then we'll go through those in order. So, um, you know, it's important that we listen to these concerns and we have the arguments to reassure people who may not be sure how they're going to vote, you know. So these are four of the frequently asked questions. Um, and it looks like uh, coming in at number one place at the moment is will it make a practical difference? So, Rachel, I'll throw to you on that one. Can you talk to that point? If people are saying, well, is this going to actually make a practical difference? How might we respond to that? Well, there's just so many ways in which it will make a practical difference that I, we could take up 10 hours on this Zoom. Um, I mean, one, one way is that it will provide a forum nationally for Indigenous people to come and develop um, common um, approaches and share ideas about what's working in their communities. Like at the moment, we, we don't really have that common platform to come together. And there will always be discussion and difference, but it will give us a place to unify, which is very important, gets gets lost, I think, in all this discussion. Um, but importantly, I think it will make a practical difference in that the diversity of Indigenous situations um, will be better understood because at the moment, a lot of the policies that are developed about us and without us um, 
don't necessarily suit the diversity of our region. So having grassroots voices be able to explain their needs from their communities will really help inform policy development. Um, and, you know, there's so many, there's so many like I'm involved in heritage reform laws at the at the moment and we're going, you know, we have the land councils involved and some of the PBCs, but, you know, the process of getting Indigenous engagement is a very long and exhaustive process for government. And if you've got a structure that is established, it'll make it much easier also for government. But then there's just ways that things work on the ground, you know. Um, in my community of Alice Springs, you know, which has been much talked about and used as a political football recently, um, you know, they've just changed the grog laws in, in the town and changed them twice. And an interesting example of how the voice might have made more of a difference is that, you know, the local Aboriginal Health Association Congress put up a whole range of views about how it should be done. But unfortunately, those views were ignored and the grog bans were changed and immediately um, we saw the results of that. So, you know, in a, just a myriad of practical ways, um, it will make a difference. But I think fundamentally it will make a difference to the nation because we'll finally not be turning away from this you know, the elephant in the room about our country, you know, that we have this 65,000 year old history. And, you know, suddenly that will, you know, that window will be open. So in just so many ways, it'll make a difference um, in a very practical on the ground way, in a national, you know, national psychological way. And internationally, you know, people will think, wow, Australia's finally maturing. <laughs> it's it's actually understanding its Indigenous past and coming to terms with it. So many ways. Yeah, brilliant. And and interestingly, Rachel, we had someone on uh, one of these chats the other week who were, used to be an advisor to a, a, a government minister and just said so often they were having to uh, make decisions on laws that affected Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and there just wasn't time to consult. They didn't know where to go. And so this would have just practically made such a, a big difference for them in the parliament trying to yeah, hear from the people that are directly impacted. So wonderful to hear through that. Um, all right, in terms of the second uh, most common objection people are interested to know about is do all First Nations uh, people support it? So Kirsty and Rachel, I might get you both to um, to weigh in on that one. Yeah, um, the, um, the question is interesting because um, in any other realm, um, a whole group of people you know, for example, Australians are not asked, do you all think the same? And clearly we don't because there are people that will um, vote for one political persuasion and not another. So difference is accepted. But when it comes to our people, there's this expectation that everyone does think the same. That's never going to be the case. But I can say that um, I, I think I can confidently say that the vast majority of First Nations people do support the voice. First of all, we saw um, obviously... Um, uh, and Rachel has referred to it, the First Nations Convention, that the overwhelming majority of delegates to that forum um, voted un un unanimously for the voice. Um, the Uluru Dialogue that I'm now working with um, recently had some uh, research undertaken that asked a very big sway. The First Nations people, do you support the Uluru Statement and do you intend to yet vote yes for a voice? And 83% of our people said they were. Um, I've also seen, you know, on the the vortex that is social media, I have had some people who, I've seen some people who previously said, um, you know, I um, want to focus on a treaty first um, and might have seemed immo immovable, who have now said um, on a practical level, um, I cannot support no, and the only way not to support no, because I can see the merits of a voice, is to vote yes. So um, the answer to that question is, in my view, a very large majority of people, um, and it's actually healthy for people um, that may not currently um, feel they can swirl behind yes to ask questions because it puts the test to us about how we explain it to people. Yeah, absolutely. And I do believe, Kirsty, that the latest polling suggests that 83% of First Nations Australians are supportive of The Voice. So I think it's a good thing for people to keep in mind. If we had 83% of, you know, non-Indigenous Australians agreeing on something, it would be it would be pretty incredible. And as you said, you know, we're not we don't expect white people to all agree, agree on everything. And it's this 
you know, unusual thing otherwise. So, yeah, thank you for explaining that. Um, Paul, I'll throw to you on the question of will it unite or divide us as a nation? Yeah, well, look, I'll flip the question around. Are we, and look, that we can't all give an answer, um, and I really ask people to reflect just to themselves, are we united now? We think back to 1788 when this became a shared history. Was it a shared experience? I'd say it wasn't. And we move on um, to the 1890s and the constitutional conventions to uh, deliberate about what kind of commonwealth we would become when we sort of partially separated from command and control from London as a, as a colony or a series of colonies to a commonwealth. Were we united then? First Nations peoples weren't acknowledged as first. We've gone on to see international uh, law reflect the um, very specific uh, innate rights of First Nations, Indigenous peoples all around the globe. And yet we don't reflect those rights in our constitution here in Australia. So the question is, are we united now? And if it's not voice, well, what is going to shift the status quo? And if we think about, I think, Kirsty might have mentioned 1967 and that referendum and 90% 90, 90 of Australians went to that referendum and voted emphatically uh, for yes in that referendum. And there were some very technical um, elements to that referendum. Uh, but what the, that emphatic decision uh, of the Australian people showed government was that we had changed significantly as, as a people, as a, as a nation, as a commonwealth, a, a commonwealth in part, if that's possible, uh, and that there was an expectation from the community that government had to do things differently. And so that's what this referendum's about. So will a voice unite us and divide us? That's really up to all of us. You know, it's up to you as an individual when you go to the, the um, ballot box on referendum day. Will it divide us? That's up to you. And that's up to your answer. Uh, it's up to what you do between now and then in the conversations you have, in the understandings that you're going and seek seeking. You know, people talk about the, the detail and we've had the honour of hearing a whole heap of detail now from two very prominent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders. So we know the details there. We know what this is about and the promise of it. But if you're still not satisfied with the information, what are you doing to go and find out more? What are you going to do to share what you know and and to appreciate this, this moment? We talked about the moment at the beginning. So personally, I know that this is a unifying moment if we get the answer right. And that's up to all of us individually. It's up, it's up to us what we do between now and coming together on referendum day, what we're doing in our networks and our communities. And I believe um, that while the voice, and we've again heard Rachel and Kirsty cover this well, it's one step, it's one reform in a series of reforms that come from the Uluru Statement and a whole heap of other work that, that's been going on for decades. Rachel talked about cultural heritage protection and a lot of us that have more recently um, started to get active or seek more information in this space were absolutely horrified by what happened uh, at the, to the Duke and Caves back in 2020, May 2020, that this could happen to our collective heritage, this precious resource and knowledge um, and these places that have been inhabited and protected for 60,000 years, 40,000 years in the case of Duke and Caves. So I believe the voice is one step towards unification and that's why I'll, I'll be voting yes. That's what's going to motivate me every day to make sure that it is a unifying moment on referendum day. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. And um, Kirsty, I'd love to throw to you for this last question. That is just, will it create special rights for one group of Australians? How, how would you respond to that? Again, just having to unmute my thing. Um, um, it won't create special rights. Already, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are recognised as the First Nations of this place. Um, and uh, Paul referred to our innate First Nations rights. Those rights already exist. Australia endorsed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People 14 years ago in 2009. And in that um, uh, declaration, it sets out the right to our people for representation. So we've passed that line. Um, I, I also want to say, and I've heard it suggested even by um, 
uh, well, by people in the no camp, for example, is that this is about recognising people based on the colour of their skin and that it's about race. And it's really important that we make it clear that it's not about the colour of our skin. It is about our First Nations identity. Um, we do have a special connection this, to this country, you know, set out in the Uluru Statement. We do have a connection of arguably 120,000 years. That is what is special. So, and this sort of recognition isn't uncommon around the world, but we don't have a voice. That's a fact. Um, despite the fact that, you know, global best practice tells us that um, giving people a, a say in the matters that affect them actually achieves results. So it doesn't give us rights that we don't already have. It recognises them and it sees them. And I also want to say, um, you know, and I'm, I'm with Paul, I genuinely hope that this will be a unifying matter for the nation. And, you know, we've made some references to polls, that there have been good ones and bad ones. And I know that I take my cues from the conversations that I have with Australians. And I don't necessarily just seek out people who I think already think like me. I like having conversations with people. I've been on the board of Reconciliation Australia for more than a decade. And I can tell you, you know, there's the, the huge numbers of Australians who've said to me, I don't know the answers, but I know that something's not quite right. You know, Henry Reynolds wrote a book that drew on an historic quote, which talked about this whispering in our hearts. There are so many Australians who feel a whispering in their hearts. Um, they say they don't know what to do to address it. Our people have told them what we would like them to do. So I hope that it will be a unifying moment for our nation. Such beautiful words. Thank you, Kirsty. And uh, let's, how do we now turn that whispering in our hearts into some action? How do we make history? So uh, we're going to give you the link to the civility tool once more. If, you're, if you've got it open, we'd love to know three things. Uh, firstly, what your level of understanding of the voice is now. Secondly, whether you're planning to support the voice. Um, if a referendum were held today, would you vote yes? And finally, let us know your enthusiasm for getting actively involved and then we're going to talk to a few of those points uh great so great to see you coming through on the screen we've got um we've jumped from about a three 3.2 to a 4.2 on average which is great that shows this session has really helped people feel more informed about the voice the support <laughs> knocking right up there at about 4.8 which is fantastic and um really high as well for the actively wanting to campaign for The Voice. So, so let's um, talk about how we might uh, do that. So um, thanks for all those responses coming through and lots of more great questions <laughs> coming through, which, as I said, keep them coming and we will, we will come back on those. Okay, so by turning up today, you've joined us for our trip from base camp into a better future. And the campaign over the coming months will be about solidifying the yes supporters while leaving the door open for convincing those who are not yet decided that this is the right decision for the nation. Uh, as we said, there are only, I think, 135 days to go, so it's critical time. And it's how we vote, but it's also about the conversations that we have with those around us to help them reach an informed decision. So we know that we have the support of the majority of Australians, but there are some who want to be sure they're making the right decision. So how do we do that? Rachel, if I could throw to you to talk about, yeah, what people could do next. Yeah, well, look, obviously this group is um, a pretty motivated group of people. Um, you're all, you know, working towards the cause in some way. Um, and um, so we see you um, as, as our main um, change makers, really. We need to activate because we, if we're the base of people who support it, we need to activate the undecideds. So um, what we need to do is get informed, get the arguments in our minds um, ready because discussion is where you change hearts and minds. And we need to get out and have conversations with our workplaces, in our networks, in our families. We need to become become change makers in our communities because that's the way um, that we're going to win this. You know, we're never going to have enough money and resources to have the hugest advertising campaign in the world or get to every place. So we need people like us, you know, people like yourselves to really get involved. And so you get informed, 
There's resources on both the Uluru Dialogues website and Yes23. You can sign up to both of those and become a volunteer. You can get training. Um, you can run kitchen table discussions. You can, we've got a big event uh, across the country, July 2nd. We're asking to, for volunteers to help organize that. We wanna have a national event um, across, yeah, every community in the country. So there's just so many ways to get involved um, and you can become a human billboard. <laughs> um, so yeah, just think about all of your networks, who you can influence, how you can activate, and let's get that like 20% of undecided on our side because that will win it. Brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. And Kirsty, over to you. How can people get involved and help from your perspective? Um, well, Rachel said things beautifully. Thank you very much. The, the absolute key has to be um, it's not enough for you to arrive at a decision that supports First Nations people. Um, and I'm saying this to um, First Nations people on this call, but also non-Indigenous allies to say, um, we want you to use every iota of influence that you have with people um, and recognise that the way you go about this is not telling people how they should vote, but reveal to them the information that they need to make a um, a sound decision and I'm really confident that they'll come to the right conclusion. We know that a lot of people are saying, um, uh, you know, and obviously it's great to see that people on this call are feeling a bit more informed about the voice or a lot more informed about it, but there are a lot of people out there who don't know enough about it. So familiarise yourself with the sorts of resources that are available. Familiarise yourself with the facts of this situation. Um, know that you and every other Australian should be responding to this with their hearts and with their minds. It's not just about, you know, the touchy-feely. And I've heard people on the no camp, in the no camp say, oh, you know, this is all about touchy-feely. It'll be, you know, a really great moment. We'll all feel really good about ourselves, which I think actually diminishes um, terribly the way that people and the importance of how people actually feel in their being about things. So I will not see that diminished. But it's a fact that people need information. They um, have been bombarded. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of um, uh, misinformation and disinformation, and that does have to be counted. So make sure that you take hold of every tool that you have. Um, and also, please um, don't be sucked into having to provide a level of detail that can't exist at the moment, which is the work of the parliament in determining, you know, the, the format, the composition, the powers, the procedures of the voice. And also, does not take account of the process that will happen after a successful referendum where our people will be asked for their views on the shape of the voice and those views will be represented to parliament. So um, remind people it's about the principle of the thing and let politicians politician after a successful referendum. Um, explain to people that a vote no is actually a vote for something. It is a vote for continuing the status quo. And if you say to people, do you think it's all right that we have the statistics that we have, whether it's in youth detention, child removal, health statistics, all of those things, um, then that needs to be brought out to the light because most people would say it's not good enough. Here is an opportunity to do something about it. And also, I think remind Australians, you know, about what we collectively have always told ourselves that Australia is about fairness and decency and giving people a hand. What does that mean in Australia today and what can it mean tomorrow? Fantastic. Thank you, Kirsty. Such such wonderful and um, inspiring words. And I believe as well that there is a Together Yes um, campaign and, and some volunteer training that's being done as well. Is that correct? Is that is that something that Uluru Dialogue? I might, let, I might let Rachel to speak to that, but also we have an Uluru Supporters Kit on our website, which is ulurustatement.org. Um, and um, it gives people a solid base of resources to now go forward and have the conversations that have to be had. And the other thing I just want to say to people at this point, because we've been getting polls, you know, left, right. Um, some of them are saying that um, support is being reduced. Some of them are saying that it's holding. The important thing is to keep the faith. We know that there's a prize that is worth fighting for. We take the responsibility really seriously to take forward what our people have been saying for decades and decades. And we want people to keep the faith. 
That's such a beautiful message for us all to carry forward, Kirsty. Keep the faith, keep the faith. Um, and Paul, I'll just pass to you as well. Um, everyone, the, the links are going in the chat box. A reminder that there will be a recording of this webinar shared. But yes, Paul, just handing to you to share um, any final call to action from yourself. Thanks, Brony. So yeah, Rachel's talked about Yes23 and Kirsty's talked about the Uluru Dialogues and um, allies for Uluru, I mentioned at the beginning, you're probably, if you've joined us today, you're in some way probably connected to our vast networks of civil society organisations that have come together under Allies for Uluru. Um, we've got four convening orgs, ANTA, Fred Hollows, ACOS and Oxfam. And we've got a secretariat team that we've pulled together that um, organise allies for Uluru. And we're a conduit straight to these two Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander-led campaigns that are really leading the way and why we're able to hear from people like Rachel and Kirsty today. So we'll cont continue to be a mobilisation and we'll continue to be a conduit to the information and the actions that's coming from those two um, pillars of the Yes campaign. Uh, so please, I, I know Brony said we're sharing those links in the chat and we'll be um, following up um, after this town hall community gathering with more information and pointing to all the things that Rachel and Kirsty have mentioned. Um, if you're a uh, part of an organisation and they're a part of Allies for Uluru, I guess you're also an accountability measure to make sure that it's not just an organisation signing up, you know, and leaving it at that, but that your organisation is actually taking actions and getting involved in a more meaningful way. It's one thing to, to say, yes, we support, but how do you support? It's in the action that counts. And if you're a part of an organization in civil society or, or anywhere really a community group that isn't a, yet a member of Allies for Uluru or connected to Yes23 or supporting Uluru Dialogues, again, you're an accountability measure. You have an opportunity to now um, agitate in your organisation, in your community, in your networks to get active and get involved and, and get connected. Uh, so yeah, that's that's Allies for Uluru. I'm really proud that we are 200 strong and growing, um, that we are a mobile, we're not a separate campaign, we really are just a mobilisation to show our support and not just that verbal support and not just a personal commitment to vote on the day in the right way, but to actually do everything we can. So. Thank you for joining us today. It's, it's been wonderful to see so many, but let this be the beginning for you, not just um, you know, a tick the box exercise. So again, wanted to thank you, Bryony, and particularly Kirsty and Rachel, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, no worries. And I think we should have another one of these soon and check in and see where everyone's going. And you know, there'll be more information and there'll be more activity. So let's check in again if we can. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kirsty. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Paul, for your fabulous input and insights. It was wonderful hearing from you today. Thank you to everyone who's on the call. We had a mammoth call today and everyone stayed on to the end. So thank you so much. Um, as was discussed, you don't need to be a constitutional lawyer. This is about having conversations. And as Kirsty said, I think that was a great, great line to end on. Let's keep the faith. Let's be having conversations and uh, getting out there into the community. And it's fun as well. You know, remember that this is actually fun to go out and, and speak with people and, and have conversations about what matters. So thanks for joining us all today. And yeah, look forward to seeing how you all go. Authorised by Rod Goodman, Oxfam Australia, 355 William Street, West Melbourne, Nam, Victoria.